Hi, good afternoon. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Um, welcome to our um, Once Club Weekly, which is normally on a Friday, but today it's on a Wednesday um, because we like to change things up, of course. Um, I am sitting down with the wonderful Sophie from Aquarius Lounge today. Um, she's going to give us um, what I would like to call an Amaz uh, 101, if you will, just a real introduction into working with the retailer um, and the brand itself as Hermes, but also kind of what it means in terms of working with um, a company such as Aquarius Lounge or, or something, or, or um, a like-for-like -like, uh, concierge service that deals with Hermes, which is sometimes looking at secondary markets. Um, I think that this is a real hot topic from customers to shoppers to brands and um, to uh, personal shopping teams alike. And I think if you're looking to really work with your clients in this particular way, having a real under firm understanding in terms of um, what this market looks like is is really imperative and um sophie is kindly um sharing some time with us today and also um in the future we're going to do some some smaller workshops with our members to um really support um how you can essentially support your clients hi sophie hello everyone thank you for joining us today how are you doing i'm very well thanks it's so lovely to be here oh good 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 so um i think just as a um i know the once club weeklies are, are, are shorter in, in nature but i think it would be really great for our guests today to just understand a little bit about um your background how you came to be working um with um you know i know you obviously do um other brands outside of ms but how you kind of um launched Aquarius as well and kind of how that started yeah so I was actually working with a production company I was in advertising for years um, and suddenly I felt like I wanted to change and it was about five years ago now that I just quit my job and I decided to go into something completely different I saw an ad saying personal shopper wanted um, in Knightsbridge so I started there um, and the team there then trained me up to be an in-house um, special because I took a real liking to the brand. I love the way that, you know, I loved the way that their brand works. I yeah, I kind of thought that was the, the top luxury, you know, per, you know, thing you can ever buy really. Um, so that was, uh, that was about four years ago. And then I spent a year there um, and about three years ago, I decided to set up on my own. Um, with my partner so he kind of gave me that real push said you know you've you've got you've got the the clients you've got the understanding you've got you know how it works go and do it by yourself um, and I had him helping me which was so so helpful I mean I couldn't have done it without him um, so that's how I really started um, and I guess Hermes was always something that I wanted to focus on because I had spelt, spent a long time building up those contacts. Um, and a lot of people used to come to me and, you know, ask me to authenticate bags because I, you know, you know that was something that I really wanted to focus on, um, making sure I understand how to spot an authentic bag. Um, and that's really been where I started. <laughs> so here I am now, we've been going with Aquarius for about, yeah, three years now. And we, our number one seller is Hermes. We focus on that a lot. Um, and we have contacts all over the world that we work with, very, very trusted people. Um, and I think we've now sold about over 500 Hermes bags. <laughs> Like considering that you know to, to know Hermes is to know that there is such a um you know if you're going into a boutique there is such a waiting yeah. list or what have you and there's a very limited release in terms of certain styles and things yeah. like that so I you know in a snapshot what you know do you guys do you specifically source um pieces like yes so people will come to us with a request um they will say you know a lot of people we get a real mixture of people coming to us actually so we'll get somebody who say right i want to invest in my first birkin what do you suggest as a classic style so those kind of people will then suggest you know we'll say well listen here's what a birkin 25 looks like 35 you know 30 see which one is the best for your build 
your style, what you want to use it for. Um, so we get those requests, but then we get a lot of people who are collectors um, and they will know exactly what they want. So some people will want super rare bags that they've been looking for years. Um, and so we also you know, keep that in the back of our mind. Um, and sometimes it can take, it can take years to find these bags for them um, because a lot of these things will be held with private collectors who you know, will hold on to it for a long time and then suddenly decide it's time to sell. So uh, most of the requests are people who know what they want, people who want a new bag for the season or you know, somebody who has a collection already. Those are our, our top uh, clients. Absolutely. So for someone who's, um, you know, looking to kind of, or has a client who's requesting a mares or would like to kind of um, work a little bit more with a mares, um, what is essentially, what would you say are the, what makes a mares a mares essentially, you know, like what is it about this particular brand that makes it so in demand? Um, so kind of, uh, it's, it's an upper echelons in terms of what we talk, talk about luxury leather goods. So I think the way that the brand has built up, you know, the Burke and the Kelly, making them such desirable bags, making them so limited, um, just making them, you know, unobtainable. So that's the reason why people see them as, you know, the bag to have. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, most people know that you can't just walk into an MS store and buy a bag. You know, you have to be on a waiting list. You have to spend, you know, at least seven to 10,000 pounds in store before they will normally consider you for a bag. Um, you have to build your profile. You have to really, you know, you have to buy a lot of the other items that you don't particularly want before you'll then get offered a Kelly or a Birkin or a Constance. Um, and they won't necessarily give you the bag you want either. So you'll you'll be you'll choose you'll have to choose colours you like. They'll make you choose about five different colours, five different leathers. Sorry, no, not 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 leathers. Um, you know, different styles, different sizes. They'll they won't just let you put one colour, one style, you know, one size, and one hardware. So you will then not necessarily get like you want. So at the end of the day, that's why there is this secondary market because people want to change the bag that they get in stores or they don't want to spend five to 10,000 pounds. They don't want to wait for nearly eight months. It normally is to be on, on the waiting list. Sometimes it can be up to three years. You can wait for, for a Kelly or a Birkin. Mm -hmm. So people want to skip that queue. They are happy to pay, pay that premium um, and get the bag they want. Absolutely. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, so yes, as you said, there is an expectation of um, building a profile with the brand outside of the leather goods market. So there is an expectation that you should be interested in ready to wear. There is an expectation of, you know, buying the jewelry, buying maybe smaller leather goods, um, homeware, et cetera, et cetera, before they're going to let you start viewing bags. And then like you said, then you have to go through the rigmarole of actually um, knowing what you want versus what they're actually going to be ha either have available or be willing to say at the time. You're also competing with super clients who have built that profile etc and who might also want to size so it doesn't so it, there's a lot of different factors here and what the secondary market is allowing you to do is to be a little bit more choosy as long as you're um understanding that you know you won't be paying retail yes. um so with maybe we can give some kind of uh, examples in terms of just key styles um that we sort of see are very popular on the market retail and otherwise and then and what that looks like in terms of pricing from and i know it varies it's a sliding scale but um could you tell us you know what are the key styles and what does that look like retail versus secondary yes of course so the most popular bag the one that we've sold the most of is a birkin 25 etane which is the light gray sorry dark gray color um togo leather and gold hardware that's been our number one seller. And it's a very classic bag. It retails at, I think, 7,800 now. And prices are going for about, they're going for about 15 to 18,000 at the moment. Um, yeah. And then, um, and so just to go back, so when we talk about a 25, we're talking about the size of the- Yes, Birkin 25 centimeter. So yeah, that is a 25 centimeter bag. 
absolutely and then and so togo we talk about a lot about you talk about a lot about leathers and hardware so these can all be interchanged um even like things like top stitching is something that can be interchanged on a bag and so that can also change in price um i think it's quite funny that you said that the etane which is um a gray color is is a very popular choice when i was working um with a former company grays were always still um grays are consistently very popular yes they are isn't it's that funny? Classic, it's a neutral they kind of see it as it's like you can wear it with anything so that is why it's such a popular color i mean black is also a number one seller mm -hmm. that just doesn't go out of style but then you know the gray you can wear in summer more and a winter so that's why it is still the number one seller over yeah like you said with the with the, your last company and what type of leather is togo um reminds me so it's more pebbly so it, it's very you know it is very hard wearing like you know it doesn't scratch like swift or box leather it's grainy but it's also you know it's slouchy mm -hmm. so it but it is a very it's the most popular leather in, in a, a little more hard wearing but like you said it and it kind of has a more malleable feel it's not so sort of yeah. stiff um exactly movement. it yeah. kind of um softens up it's not um, like epsom leather which is yeah, exactly. very very stiff and you know that is the hardest wearing leather the epsom leather mm -hmm. um, but it's more structured right exactly and then um so birkin as we know is named after jane birkin um and then we have the kelly which is obviously named after yeah jane, uh, grace kelly yeah. so um and then give us and then so i you know how do you um i'm interested to know how do you differentiate between the two bags in terms of just style um from birkin to kelly and kind of what the, the different expectations are so with the kelly there's actually a longer waiting list for a kelly at the moment the okay. kellys take longer to make so in the Hermes factory in Paris, they'll take longer to construct a Kelly bag because it's more, there's a lot more stitching to do and it's tricky to, you know, get that top stitch on. Um, so it, that um, has made the price go up a little bit more recently. We've seen Kelly 25s have been so, so in demand. When I think about three years ago, it was, we were selling, you know, make, probably 60 or 70 percent Birkins um, and the rest Kelly's. Now we are selling completely 50 50. Wow. Um, they are so popular. They are just as popular as the Birkin. And I would say the Kelly is a little bit more um, ladylike, if you will, in a sense. It's a little bit more dainty. She yeah. has more of a structure. Um, if the, if that's what you want. Handle, and then you've got the strap as well. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people like the fact that you can wear it you know on your arm or you can have it over your shoulder so Absolutely. i think that's a real selling point yeah for sure and um so kind of what kind of pricing if you wanted to say compare a, a kelly 25 from retail to to secondary what would that look like so a kelly 25 is about the same at the moment okay. for the classic colors but the um the most popular kelly is the kelly 25 in the epsom leather so a lot of people like that small structured bag in the neutral colors as well. Um, gold, um, a Kelly 25 gold, gold hardware has been the most popular bag that we've sold. We've sold so many of those. Um, that's been number one seller. Yeah. And there's also, there's always like a huge demand for um, like a mini Kelly or. Mini or Kelly is so, so in demand right now. It's, it's crazy about four years ago nobody wanted a mini kelly they thought it was too small because you can't fit much in it you can fit you can't even fit the new iphone in it <laughs> so people would just have it with their lipstick and they thought it was very impractical and now you know small bags are having such a big hit right now they're having the biggest moment right now so we are getting so many requests for mini kellys and everyone loves the summer you know summer colors bright bright green pink um baby blue baby pink as well have been really really popular absolutely yeah i've been seeing a lot of um green is getting a lot of attention yes. i think from yes. a stage to yes. a live to a mint these yeah. seem like very top sort of um coverable uh colors at the moment oh, within the yes. market which is interesting so when you talk about uh 
you know, when we were talking about, you know, the secondary market and you were talking about contacts, can, you know, what does that mean in terms of, are you dealing with a mixture of um, retail and private sellers? Are you dealing with other sort of, you know, if you want to call them uh, Hermes dealers or personal shoppers, you know, how does it, how does it work typically? Yeah, so we, um, Aquarius are on a network of worldwide Hermes suppliers. Um, we only ever work with people we trust. There are so, so many people out there trying to scam you, trying to, you know, fit, fool you into believing that they have real bags or they have a store or that they have an online shop and that they sell authentic bags, but they don't. Um, so that's it. We have to be so, so careful about who we work with. Mm -hmm. um, we only work with that group of people we trust. We make sure that we have a supplier agreement with them. So we are completely covered. We make sure we have all of their details, their ID, make sure we know exactly who we're buying from. Um, this is also to cover us as a company. Um, and you know, if we got inspected to then have those documents to make sure we know who we're buying from as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very important because there are so many people on Instagram, especially trying to sweet talk you and will say, hello dear, um, I have this bag for you. It's a great price. You are so lucky and try and manipulate you into thinking that they're your friend and that they are trying to then sell you a real bag. Um, and it's happened to so many people out there. Um, I hear stories every week of people being scammed. Um, so that's something people have to be so careful of. Um, just make sure you do your research, make sure they have a company, make sure, you know, even if they have a company, that you get their ID, you get their address. Don't rush into a sale just because you want to make a sale. That's my Absolutely. advice. Absolutely, and I think it's really important, you know, from a personal shopping perspective, um, one of the things, you know, that I learned very early on when it came to dealing with MS was that, um, do you, like you said, do your research. Who is this other, who are these people selling to? Yeah. You know, the network for personal shopping is still very small. So if there's someone who's a reputable seller, it's likely that they're using contacts that you use. And I would absolutely delve into that network. Um, being VAT registered or having a company registered number, I think is also um, a great way to ensure like there's a certain amount sense of uh, security, if you will, within that. And then it's also having an understanding of, um, the styles um that they're talking about and also pricing i think it's important to also have maybe a couple of, to know a couple of sellers so you understand so you get a sense of pricing now um you were talking about popularity for example and then there's also rarity and uh similar to the watch market depending on what the style is and uh the 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 supply or you know the availability of that piece pricing can can absolutely vary so much yeah. it can really vary exactly and you might see that there was a particular bag that might be sort of floating for generally around anywhere between i don't know and i'm going back a few years so maybe the pricing is a bit skewed now but 12 to 15 so if you know that you know if you've had two or three suppliers kind of quote you around those pricing um that seems right but if someone's coming way under that or way over yes it could set off a bit of an alarm bell correct mm -hmm to know the current market price is very important. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I would say, you know, prices have gone up so much in the last year, mm -hmm. you know, ever since the beginning of um, lockdown, actually, um, Hermes stopped producing as many bags because they couldn't, um, you know, they didn't have enough staff to make all their bags um, as they're all handmade. So the prices skyrocketed, you know, mm -hmm. they are still kind of, you know, on the higher side, like mm -hmm. we were selling a classic Kelly 20 black Epsom gold hardware in 2019 for 14,000 pounds. And now the price is 18 to 19,000 pounds, like nothing below that right now. Yeah. You know? Isn't that crazy? So, yeah, it's quite a jump. And they are, I mean, more and more people are understanding that Hermes is such a good investment, mm -hmm. you know, lots of lots of people um you know lots of finance people have come to me and say you know what should i invest in um and it really is an amazing investment um to to hold on to these bags because they're not going down <laughs> they're yeah. really not. and that's the truth you know as much as um people i think can be 
skeptical let's let's face it within terms of you know how is it appreciated i you only ever see um the pricing go up and i think you know the only time that you're only you're really seeing something a particular style for example go maybe for something uh less than what you would expect is usually if it's um sort of not a particularly um if it's vintage but not super popular in demand or it's not uh or it's pre-owned and it probably it hasn't maybe got the best um quality in yeah, terms exactly. of you know, treated as many after as well if people have kept it well for example i've got a bag here actually oh, um, yeah same. yeah so it's a pre-loved kelly pochette in miel beautiful absolutely amazing color you know it's such a rare color um and this has is, is about 10 years old and it's been kept absolutely immaculately yeah, lady has barely used it so that one you know i think the retail was about twelve thousand euros um and it sold for twenty thousand pounds so, you know, this person has kept it in immaculate condition um, and, you know, that's why it's held its value. Mm -hmm. So as long as you keep all the paperwork, um, you know, you keep it in good condition, keep it in the box, um, it will hold on to its value. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, because you specifically showed us that um, one, I think it's a great time to talk about um, exotic skins because exotic skins are such a huge part of... Um, Emma's in terms of the collection, A for the rarity. Yeah. Um, the, the pricing is wildly different, obviously, as you can imagine, to regular leather. Um, but how is that in terms of the, um, and also the color means that it's different because depending on what exotic skin you're working with actually limits certain colors. And I think that's where you um, you touched on it before that um, it's important to note that one of the reasons why Emma's is, you know, so renowned is that their pieces are handmade you know everything is and there's a lot they have a lot of control in terms of what their supply looks like from tannery to factory to studio etc etc so um that actually limits a lot what you can do in terms of exotic skins and not and therefore that determines the price isn't that right absolutely i mean there's not as many um exotics being made at the moment either you know they've really stopped making as much mm -hmm. um so that makes it even harder to get hold of yeah. and you know also with um reselling what they're doing now is they're stopping giving a lot of the clients the actual cites that you need to export the products so you know people uh, and they're catching on to the fact that people are reselling things as well and they don't really want that to happen especially if it's a brand new bag they don't want somebody to just sell it on to somebody if they bought it in in the uk to sell it on to somebody in um you know asia so they've they've stopped giving out the cites as much so that makes it harder to resell those bags because you can't ship those bags without those documents 100 and so just to for our viewers who might not be um super aware of CITES, CITES is essentially um a group of um if you want to call them restrictions or um uh, and all requirements that allow you um of documents that will allow you to have a very clear uh chain of of um information of in terms of where this bag comes from and that comes from literally from um the the first place of where that skin particularly comes from to the tannery and it has to essentially have a, a, a complete journey before it even becomes to store and what those documents are there for and this is for anything this is not specific to Hermes this is to do with anything that is um an exotic skin for clothing bags shoes what have you the idea is that to be there are different uh would you say um rules and requirements for different countries for different skins and what you're allowed and so therefore to be able to even sometimes travel with a particular bag you have to be able to show that you have um proof of where this uh journey has come from and that it's been done in a way that is you know within the law it's like a CITES certificate exactly and that that it's accompanies... basically a passport for your bag yes exactly yeah that was a great way to put it perfect Sophie a passport for your bag <laughs> like a visa <laughs> so... <laughs> um and like you said because you know that there is 
it's essentially, you know, the societies are there. I actually did a, a two day course and um, the, the, the lady who did the course sort of put it quite simply is that um, the rules are there to restrict travel. So it is, <laughs> so that is literally what they, they do. Um, so if it sounds complicated, complicated, it is, and it is by design, but it's a huge part of what, how you may want to communicate with your client um, when it comes to requests and um, actual ac the actuality of become, being able to kind of um, get that back, if I'm not. Yes. And a lot of the time, you know, especially when, before COVID, we would offer to hand deliver um, exotic bags just because I feel safer, you know, delivering that beautiful bag and that amount of money to the client directly. Mm -hmm. um, so I've done a lot of trips just to drop off bags in Qatar, <laughs> Middle East, whatever, um, and uh, hand over the bags. Uh, and then you feel much happier that you've, you've given it directly to the client. Um, it does scare me a little bit shipping all these um, pieces. Oh, well. I mean, you have to have the right documents, but still, you know, there's always that, that possibility that something could go missing. And if it's a really, really rare bag, it's just safer to get somebody to travel to you or go and deliver it yourself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've been very much, you know, I've had clients where they've just said, I'm coming. Yeah. You know, we've, we've done the sale in February, but they come in August and that's yeah. when they get their bag because they would much rather be safe, safer than sorry. Um, because like you said, you know, it, it can end up touching multiple hands and you know there's a certain sense of lack of control there and i think with emes the one thing you want to do is have all the control. oh my goodness exactly you really do yeah <laughs> yes, um i think it would be also um how do you communicate with say like a first-time buyer or or not, not necessarily even a first-time buyer maybe someone who's used to retail but is now coming to the secondary market you know what would you say are your top lines of communication with that i get this question a lot i um you know i get the question well aren't you sourcing directly from MS. Why is the price so much higher? And I have to explain what I said right at the beginning, you know, MS, you know, you have to build up that relationship with the store. You have to put in a couple of years, you know, of buying items and buying, you know, at least £7,000 worth of things in the store. And then you aren't going to necessarily get what you want. So I always say to them, listen, you know, this is the way it works. There is this secondary market because, you know, MS holds its value. There is such value in these items and, you know, they are only going up. We've only ever seen them go up um, every year. Even all these pre-owned bags, they've all gone up. So people, people, a lot of people have held onto the bags that they bought in store and just sat on them. And, you know, a 2018 bag that was less um you know retail was about six and a half thousand then so they've held on to it and now it's you know for a classic b25 black togo gold hardware it's now eighteen thousand pounds you know they've held on to that and they know that it's going to go up so what i'd say is you know these these bags are so in demand you cannot just walk into store trust me we've all tried you know all of my clients have have gone into store thinking they can get them for themselves but it's not that easy. So we are here to help you get the bags you want. Obviously there's going to be a markup, but eventually these, these bags are still gonna go up. They're still creeping up. Mm -hmm. um, so it is an investment. And if you do want that bag, you have to pay a premium um, in the nicest way possible. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you communicate, um, so, you know, COVID, I'm sure even before COVID, you because you are global, you probably very um, adept to, um, let's say, digital selling or social commerce. How do you present the styles to kind of, because, you know, that, that, that there's a certain sense of, uh, how would you say, um, you know, you're obviously dealing with trusted uh, suppliers in, in a sense but also your clients have to trust you that you know they really have an understanding of what you're selling is what they're going to get on the other end so how do you kind of communicate you know the bag that they want or the bag that you're selling and making sure that they have a really true sense of what that is when they receive it rather than receiving going this isn't the right color this isn't what i, I thought think was. we're very very careful about sending them all the photos up front you know especially if it's a new color 
and colors can look slightly different in different light. Mm. Um, so we're very, very clear. We always take our photos in daylight. Every time somebody orders something before we purchase the bag, we will get all the photos. We'll get the photo of the stamp, the receipt, so they can see all the angles. The bag is perfect condition um, and then send that, send that over to them. We also do our checks when it comes to us. We will authenticate the bag, make sure everything is perfect, um, send them photos as well then, make sure they're happy, ship the bag to them or they will collect it or we will drop it off to them. Um, and then, you know, everybody's normally happy with their order because we've taken those precautions and we've always been very upfront about everything with them. And I think that's important to just be really upfront. Um, and of course, I've had those people who, you know, doubt you at the beginning, you know, who say, yeah, how can I trust you? Um, and I think it's, it's a hard one because you don't want to be too pushy. And, um, you know, I've heard it from scammers. I've heard people say, trust me, dear, I'm, you know, I'm here, you can see me, like, I'm talking to you. Um, and still, they are scammers. So you don't want to be too over the top. Um, I think, you know, I would say if, if they, you know, if it's their loss if they don't buy through you. But um, if you really want to push that sale, just be yourself. Um, talk to them in a, in a way that you would talk to a friend almost sometimes. I find that that is uh, the way that's worked best for us. Um, and a lot of my clients send me voice notes and we'll voice note back. And so they get an understanding of who you are and can, can hear your voice. Um, and then sometimes I've done FaceTimes with people just to show them, you know, I have some stock or, you know, they can see my face and understand that I am actually a real person. Um, so that really a long way. It's, yeah. In a world where we're doing everything with WhatsApp and emails and, yeah. and Instagram and what have you, I think being able to still kind of say, I'm going to pick up the phone or, you know, whether it's video or not, and really talk you through this process. And still um, making the time for them as well, yeah. you know, yeah. so yeah. like, especially, you know, with, with these huge orders, um, you know, it's a big deal. It's a lot of money and they're putting a lot of trust into you. So you want to make them feel as relaxed and happy as you can. Um, absolutely and I think you you were absolutely right um just in terms of having you know it sounds so simple yeah. but um being able to take pictures in true light can make yeah. all the difference because it's sometimes an expectation and we've um I've done previous talks and with um experts from sort of uh you know with, with gems and something that came out of that they were saying you know um these, these different gems actually look different in different places of the world even because the light reflects differently right. and I think anytime like you're dealing with lenses and stuff you have to take that in you really have to make that um clear of you know this is the true color this is the like for like um you know the amount you know you don't want to have 20 images but I think you need to have as true likeness yes. as possible you know a video goes a long way hard you know close-ups of hardware and also I think that there's a certain sense of um insurance you know protecting yourself as a seller and a buyer essentially Absolutely. when it comes to to the chain of pieces so you know accepting pieces among you know like you said by doing authentication is important and then being able to prove that authentication to a client um having the receipt so you know that you have a certain customer journey um for authentication also goes a long way uh, as well and um and and how would you say um I think it's always interesting to know the differentiation between say a piece. Cause I know sometimes certain places come, for example, if you're dealing with a private seller or it's maybe from an auction, maybe you're not getting things like uh, accessories, boxes, um, have you, in terms of, does that um, hugely affect pricing as well? Yes, I guess if you don't have full set, it, do, it, does, it does affect the price. But then again, if it's a really, really rare bag, really rare color, like this miel, there's not many of these Kelly pochettes around um, in that brown. They don't make that color very much. So that, you know, yeah, it did have a full set, but if it, if it didn't, it wouldn't have mattered so much. Mm -hmm. um, but with classic leather bags, you know, if you don't have the full set, it, it does make an impact. Um, I guess it totally depends on the, the, the condition of the bag though. Like yeah. that's the main thing. You know, we can always find another box that, um, you know, has been used for another bag sometimes. 
but then you can't scrub up a, a you know, a, a Birkin. <laughs> yeah, you can always get a dust bag. Yes. Even like, you know, I think if you have a good relationship regardless, um, because we've done this, I've done this in the past where, you know, you can get the accessories for these bags. You can actually polish, you know, the hardware, etc. So, but like you said, you know, if the leather is, you know, typically damaged, it's more or not been taken care, you know, that is a much different, <laughs> saga in it's in, in it's Absolutely. yeah um if we do we don't normally do questions q and a's on um once club weeklies but if we do have any quick questions um i'd love to uh take those um now you can write those in oh someone straight away um <laughs> do you think um constance is a good investment and also how popular is the birkin shoulder model oh great question oh the um the constants are wish list bags now so they are a good investment. It totally depends on the color. If you get a classic color and the hard wearing leather, um, a lot of the constants come, to it, come in swift, which is a very fine leather and it scratches quite easily. Mm. So if it was that one, I'd say no, but with the, uh, with the classic um, colors and the hard wearing leather, um, such as Epsom, then that is a good investment because they are, yeah, they're harder to get now. They used to be much easier to get. And suddenly in the last few years, they are harder to get. Yeah, there was a time when we actually, we always had a lot, there was always a lot of constances available. Um, and then um, recently, I don't know if you saw, the, there was a Christie's, um, record-breaking Christie's sale for a constant. Yes, I saw that, yes. Um, yes. It was over $100,000, I believe. Um, and I'd never seen anything like it. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. We could, you, you know, in terms of uh, resale or, or, you know, secondary market constants about three or four years ago, you could get one for as little as eight to nine. Yeah. Right. So, um, so it's crazy to then be like, yeah. 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 Um, what do you, and, and what about the um, Birkin shoulder model? Birkin shoulder model, is that the smaller, smaller one? I'm not sure which, which style they're talking about. I'm not sure. Maybe if you, um, this is actually one of our um, power members, um, Gennady, if you send us a picture. Yeah, yes, yeah, she goes, yes, and long. But um, we can even, 42 centimetres. Oh, being specific now. Oh, is it sh shoulder, a shoulder bag? Oh, so is, is it the hack? 42 centimetres. Could be, it sounds like the hack. Send us a picture, um, Gennady, and then those I'll are the those, yeah. I'm pretty sure those are ones that they don't make anymore. Oh, okay. So yeah, I'm sure there would only be vintage ones. Mm. Oh, okay, if you have a picture, <laughs> Sophie can definitely look into that yeah, for you awesome. and give you a bit more information. Um, another question here is, um, can you give us more information around um, horseshoe? The horseshoe. Um, oh, sure. Horseshoe bags, yeah. Mm. So horseshoe bags are special orders. So you basically have to be invited. You have to be a very, very good client of MS. Um, and I only know two, two people who have been offered this service. So it's basically de designing your own bag. So one of my friends in the industry got a Birkin 25 made. Um, very nice, her husband just got a Ferrari. So she ended up designing this bag to match the Ferrari. <laughs> so wow. it's black and it has red inside um, and it has this like white stitching. It's absolutely amazing. And then it will have the horseshoe stamp on the bag. Um, so yeah, we see these bags come onto the market, you know, quite a lot as well. Um, but people are very, very wary of obviously selling these bags um, because they don't want to be traced um, because they probably worked uh, for a long time with their sales associate to build up their profile and then also have this bag made mm -hmm. and they're one-offs. So, you know, people hold on to them for a little bit longer. Um, and a lot of the time we'll see them come on as vintage. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, and I assume that means that drives the price as well. Because, yes, because, exactly. it is because, one -off. they're, yeah, because they're one-offs. There was one recently, which was a um, pink bubble gum with Grizz interior. Um, crock and the, the price I think was 300,000 pounds um, that they were asking. I, I don't know if it's sold for that much, but uh, <laughs> because it's so, so rare yeah. and that baby pink and gray together 
it's an amazing combination yeah lovely (laughs) um this has been absolutely fascinating and i'm so looking forward to doing um more with you and our members um going forward but in the meantime if you have any questions for sophie or if you actually have client requests um we can absolutely um put you in touch just get in touch with us on the platform and we will put you in direct contact with um sophie or her team and um i know she's really open to asking questions and i think you know i've worked with sophie enough for a couple of years and she's always got um great information that surrounds these pieces and i think the more information you have around what's happening in the current market is a really great way to build trust with clientele and i think that's what you should lean into so you can learn a lot um as well as sort of you know surprising and delighting your customers um so yeah just let us know what we can do and we will definitely um get sophie and aquarius uh to to support you with that but uh sophie thank you so much Oh, so lovely, thank you so much for having me oh no i'd love to come and show show you guys some more bags as well it's always lovely to see the bags in person as well so right. we can bring a really amazing selection of bags over to you and uh do a little day we would love to do something yeah. in person for sure now that things are opening up and we can make that re- reality it's really yeah, exciting. Really yeah. yeah and i think it's also great i think you talked a little bit about authentication and i think that's something that we can really lean into as well with with kind of educating our members so um yeah we would love to to do something in person that'll be really exciting thank, thank you. you thank you so much thank you, thank you so much bye everyone take care bye, bye.